It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Shuddhavrata Sen Gupta, an artist and curator with the Rux Media Collective, who is chairing this evening's lecture by Azun of Boku. Uh, a few technical points about this evening's event. We request you to keep your audio and video off and would also like to inform you that the session is being recorded. The lecture will be for 45 minutes and there will be a discussion and Q&A of 15, 20 minutes. We request you to type your questions or comments in the chat box during as well as uh, after the discussion, which Shuddha will be taking as they come in. I will now hand over to Shuddha to introduce Azu and to commence the program. Over to you, Shuddha. Thank you, Guy3. I hope I'm audible. Um, it's a real pleasure to be um, a part of this evening. Um, I'd like to really commend the Sheryal Sundaram Arts Foundation for the trailblazing work that they're doing in supporting new practices and um, new work. Uh, it really is like a legacy for the future that Devan and Geeta have given us all. So thank you for that. Congratulations to Imran and Anita for what looks like a fascinating project. I'm very curious and excited to know more. And now it's my very pleasant task to introduce Azu Nogbogu, whom I nearly missed or, or missed very closely, like in a spy novel in Lagos, Nigeria, only I think four days ago. So we must have entered and exited the same space undercover and unbeknownst to each other because I only had a very fascinating portrait photograph of him to recognize him by in the dim light of a active party, I couldn't recognize him. So it's fantastic to meet like this. And I hope that one day we will meet again in person. Um, Azu Nagbogu is, um, just a moment, um, I'm reading from too many screens. Azu Nagbogu is the founder and director of African Artists Foundation, a nonprofit organization based in Lagos, Nigeria. Noak Bogu was appointed as the interim director or head curator of the Zietz Museum of Contemporary Art in South Africa from June 2018 to August 2019. He also serves as the founder and director of Lagos Photo Festival. And I was happy to see the latest iteration of the Lagos Photo Festival a few days ago. And serves as founder and director of um, annual international art Lagos. He's the publisher of Art Base Africa, a virtual space to discover and learn about contemporary art from Africa and its diasporas. And he's a he's of special interest in future museology, which is an intriguing and, and fertile concept that I hope that he will talk to us a little more about. His lecture, The Image is an Object, Liberated Bodies, Charged Objects. And if I'm not mistaken, that was the title of the Lagos Photo Festival this year, am I right? Yes. Um, we'll look at how images are semi-intangible objects inherently charged with memory that have far-reaching possibilities for restitution, community regeneration, societal expression, or decolonization. I'm particularly interested because Africa has this really rich tradition of, like, of studio portraiture, Nigeria, Ghana. We know the work of James Barnor and other photographers who have really contributed in a sense to the integrity of the person through photography. And I find this very interesting because it's almost like a counterpoint to the, to the ethnographic gaze of colonial masters who used photography to imprison the human body as an image. So this tension between a new subjectivity through the photographic image to the confidence of performative portraiture and the, the, um, the imprisoned person in the, in the in the anthropological photograph is, is an interesting tension. And I hope that you will be talking a little bit about that. Through projects like Home Museum and Lagos Photo, um, Azu and his colleagues encourage local communities to take charge of the restitution conversation by building their own archives and repositories and navigating the narrative beyond a Western or a stereotypical colonial gaze. Um, lots to unpack, lots to listen to, lots to think about. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Azu. Thank you very much, Shida, for the generous introduction. Thank you, Umar Singh Shagil Foundation, for honoring me with this uh, 
um, great opportunity to share some ideas. And as the um, the chair of the jury, it was a really um, interesting time meeting other co my colleagues and my fellow jurors and deliberating and awarding Anita and Imran the unanimous award. Um, it's really uh, a privilege to have this opportunity to share with you. I also thank Shrida for uh, hinting a little bit at the idea of liberated bodies. Uh, that is the idea of, that's to, that's to say, the challenge or the the um, counter conduct or counter culture of an image that has been trapped by a colonial gaze, liberated through um, self portraiture in studio photography. But more to that later. If you don't mind, I'm going to just quickly start by sharing my screen. The image as an object, liberated bodies, charged objects. Um, we've come a long way since Marcel Duchamp's famous fountain, 1917. Um, everyday objects, in his own words, raised to the dignity of a walk of art by the artistic, by the artist act of choice. This act of choice may be varied, subjective, emotive, unmotivated by various interests and desires. For survival or for feeling, it matters not. It is what matters is that the artist has decided that this is a work of art and it matters to him or to her or to them. Um, the fountain was rejected when um, Marcel Duchamp presented this fountain in 1917. Um, it was rejected. It was not rejected by the Society of Inde Independent Artists because um, he had paid the fee. And the rule was that any, ob any work of art will be presented and shown as long as you pay the fee. But, um, but the work was never shown during the exhibition. The fact of its survival today and the fact that it's part of art history today is because it was photographed and journaled by Alfred Stieglitz in 19, uh, 1917 and published in a data journal called Blind Man of that year. In 2004, the fountain was voted the most influential artwork of the 20th century. Why have I given this Marcel Duchamp introduction the center stage in this conversation? Well, the fountain that you see in the picture right there, no one has seen this particular fountain. No one has ever seen it apart from the select committee in New York in 1917. Um, what survived and why we have this big and major conversation around this object as part of art history is because of the very image and very memory of it as photographed by Alfred Stieglitz's studio back in the early 20th century. Um, during the introduction, they would mention that I was uh, the director and chief curator at the Zeitz Museum. And in my time at the Zeitz Museum, I was I began to imagine how we in the 21st century reproduce and follow automatically um, hierarchies that we've inherited around colonialism and museology, the methods of collecting today. I was interested and intrigued by how different are these methodologies, uh, radically, a radical departure from what we, we consider to be blatantly colonial and, and, um, and uh, abusive and violent. And um, without creating too much subjectivity to the matter, I just want to present, I, I began to think about how we could radically change this approach, how we could radically restitute and think about new ways of collecting, new ways of building memory, new ways of building archive, new ways of building institutions beyond the automatic um, acceptance of the museum of the of the of the 20th century that we've all normalized as, as you know something to be valorized or something that is accepted as the peak or the the very pinnacle of our history or or of acceptance of for your work as an artist um uh, the objects as extension of memory I'll get more into it a little bit later, but let me start by uh, a little bit of background into the work that I've done or we've done through Lagos Photo Festival over the past uh, 14 years, over the past 13 editions. So in 2010, we launched Lagos Photo with the exhibition called No Judgment, Africa Under the Prism. 
Then we moved in next year, what's next Africa, the hidden stories, seven days in the life of Lagos. We wanted Lagos to be a host for the ideas that we're interested in. Then in 2013, we launched the mega city and the non-city we're interested in non-tangible um, spaces like the internet and how these provide a safe space for artists and for visual, um, visual, uh, for visual culture in general. And we've come to charged objects in 2022, um, liberated bodies and charged objects. And this <laughs> evolution of ideas that we presented over the years have been driven by a thematic representation of what have been important at that particular time in the history, or we see it in contemporary visual culture, in the history of contemporary visual culture that relates to not just Africa, but also its diaspora and, and beyond. <laughs> Lagos Photo has always had an idea to bring, to host the world through a community of photography and to think about the thematic representation of these ideas in real time. I'll just go through a few more um, additions, images that you may see, Seven Days in the Life of Lagos, and some of our collaborations. <coughs> so these are some images from Lagos Photo over the years 2014, 2016, 2018, time has gone, and Lagos Photo 2020. And this is the exhibition that we're going, this is the conversation that we're going to launch with today. So in Lagos, in 2020, during the lockdown, and I remember um, Anita talked about being in confinement and making new work. And so um, Anita was talking about the home museum, about being at home in lockdown and being in confinement. And during that same period, we launched the home museum. The idea of the home museum. So I was talking about how when I was in South Africa, um, we, I was the director of the museum and the chief curator over there. And we were interested in building collections and what it means to build a, a new collection for an institution in the 21st century. And we were very worried about, I was very concerned about how today's methodologies of, of uh, collecting or today's collecting, collecting practices were not that different from the collecting practices of the 20th century and the 19th century and how they just be mollified and um, um, you know, maybe attenuated, but not that radically different. And then we started thinking about the big conversation in contemporary art today, which is restitution. And restitution is a topic that relates to, it's a global conversation that relates to people in India, in Asia, in Africa, in Europe, all over the world. It's a massive conversation today that, um, um, so I've been interested in, in restitution as a topic. And of all, I'm also interested in the idea of collecting and the idea of memory and the idea of how objects become, what's the value in objects and how objects can be, um, the, role of, the role objects play in shaping memory and shaping history and shaping identity. Um, I believe that Anita and Imran have the same idea in, in some of their work, especially the work that they had shared earlier on. Uh, and um, and uh, in 2020, during the lockdown in March, in April, we launched the idea of the Home Museum. And we wanted to see the role of, explore the role of photography in accelerating or in creating awareness and civic intelligence amongst everybody in globally around restitution and why it matters. Because the conversation seemed to me at the time to have been hijacked by, um, by um, academics, by politicians, by intellectuals, but the people itself, artists, civic people, students, young people, they had sort of no awareness about the role of restitution in, or the role or in the importance of heritage and objects in shaping identity. And so we launched this, like, this project called Rapid Response Restitution as a way, you know, the, the idea of rapid response is, you know, the photo the, is a sort of ode to the quick click of a camera, how you rapidly, um, how you can rapidly make photos and how that rapidity and that speed allows you to engage with the idea of restitution in a, in a civic space. And so we, we sculpted a letter and the letter said, was written to, to the general public and translated into about 20 languages, um, several African languages, Chinese, Russian, 
uh, French. And the idea was to share this, to distribute this letter and to send it out virally and to get people to send in between six and 12 objects. These objects are objects that we call objects of virtue, objects that have a sort of um, significance in shaping the idea of space or home. And so we built what we call the home museum. And these are objects that if I said to Gerati, for example, that listen, we're going to move to Africa, you're going to live, to live in Lagos, but you don't need anything. You don't need clothes, we're gonna go shopping and buy everything you need. But I want you to pick between six and 12 objects in your home that you can take with you that make you feel at home in Lagos. Or if I was saying to, if I, if I was moving to Japan and I had, and I wanted to feel at home in Japan, what are the six to 12 objects that I'll take with me to allow me to feel at home in Japan, to feel like I'm part of, you know, I'm still, my cosmology and my cosmogony is oriented in the right way in that, in that space. And this is how we built the idea of the home museum. So we had respondents send in between six and 12 objects, images of these objects, not the objects themselves. And they described why these objects had a particular signification for them. And, um, and that's how we built the home museum. And when you have a moment, I implore you to go to www.homemuseum.net to see what we've done with the home museum and to navigate the space. But the importance of the, the signification of the home museum was to, as I said, to spark an interest amongst the general common population around the idea of restitution and heritage and the role of photography in sparking this civic intelligence in normal people. So it wasn't about restitution that happens between um, governments, you know, this, this current conversation around restitution and returns, it's really one that happened on a relic diplomacy level. We wanted to bring it to the ground and bring it to the average person on the street. And, um, uh, and um, if you go on the website, you'll see that we had over 300 uh, respondents sending their images between six and 12 images, and they described why those images were important to them. Some people sent in photographs of their great grandparents or their parents. Someone sent a photo of a tooth. Someone sent a graduation picture or a letter from a grandparent. So it allowed us to be, begin to build this idea of space and cosmogony and identity through images and through objects. And if you recall the first slide that I shared with you, it was the, it was the image of uh, the fountain by um, by uh, Marcel Duchamp, shot by Alfred Stieglitz. And remember, I, I had informed that that particular urinal is, has never been seen by anyone else because it was destroyed or thrown away. No one knows what happened to it, and it was never exhibited. But the image by Stieglitz is what has transferred throughout over 100 years to, you know, throughout this, to, to this particular moment. And, um, and then back to the home museum, then in January of 2021, I received a letter from Ana Briongos, who is a Spanish, a Catalan based uh, writer who shared with me a very intriguing story of a suitcase. And again, I don't know if any of you know about Marcel Duchamp's story of a suitcase, but I could see another relatability and connection with images and objects. So in, on January 27, 2021, Ana Briongos, a Barcelona based writer, got in touch with me and shared the story of a mysterious suitcase left with her mother 50 years, some 50 years ago. The owner of the suitcase, Nigerian Prince Emmanuel Adewale Oyenuga, had asked Anna's mother to hold on to the suitcase before leaving Barcelona for London with his wife Elizabeth in the early 70s. And neither Anna nor her mother have heard from Prince Emmanuel Oyenuga for since that time. And so Anna Bianca has got in touch with me and shared with me, wrote a very beautiful and intriguing letter and said to me that Azu, I'd like to return this suitcase to the family. And I do not know how to get in touch with them for the last five years, we've been trying to reach them. Um, and again, this is about collaboration because again, this happened during the lockdown in 2020 and we couldn't travel and she lived in Barcelona. So I called a friend of mine, Maurice Neumola, who, is a professor of photography teaching in Barcelona. And within a week, Maurice went to visit Ana Briangos and unpacked the suitcase. And um, 
managed to photograph and scan every single letter, every single image, every single photograph in the archive. And um, back to Shud, um, Shud had mentioned the, about studio photography. This suitcase also contained an incredible archive of studio photographs. There are two important aspects of the story of the archive. One is the moral aspect, and the second is the intellectual aspect. The moral aspect is Anna Briongas's desire to return the suitcase to the family. It was a moral imperative for her. The intellectual was the research and the finding that we, the curatorial team at Lagos Photo, along with Maurice Noimola and um, Dr. Carmen Perez Gonzalez made around the letters and the objects and the photographs in the, in the, um, in the archive. This archive had remained intact for 50 years hadn't been opened, had been remained untouched. And so it was really interesting to begin to unearth and to get into it and to begin to read the archive. And as you know, an archive is something that's quite radioactive. You, the moment you touch it and you interact with it, you contaminate it and it contaminates you. And you begin to find the intelligence within it and what knowledge you can find codified in those archives. And um, for a lot of curators who had worked around this idea of studio photography be before me, like Okri and Weza, would um, you'd see in the work of uh, Okri, for example, the the way um, studio photography challenged the idea of Afro pessimism, and the role of studio photography in opening up um, the idea of modernity to the rest of the world about Africa. But within this archive, we're able to find and build a little bit of the history of studio photography in Africa and the major players. There are Fakun Studio, Paradise Photo Studio, Paramount Photographers from the UK, Arowolo Photo Service, a local based studio with a franchise partner in France, and Emmanuel's Home. And we've been able to map, make a map, a visual map of all of these studios that were active around the Prince's home based on this archive at the time. And then talking about the image as an object and the object as a, as a tool for memory, uh, some of you might know that the Yorubas have a, an obsession with twins and twinning. And um, because uh, in certain towns in Yoruba land in the Western part of Nigeria have the greatest um, birth rate for twins in the world. Something and the difference between that, the, the these town, this, this town in in southwestern Nigeria, and say the second highest um, t uh, part of the world with a similar birth rate or with a high birth rate of twins, is so much. It's such it's such a huge gap. It's there's such a huge difference between the twinning in in southwestern Nigeria and any other part of the world. And scientists have explored various reasons as to why that is so, but it's still yet unclear. Um, and then there's the idea of the Ibeji dolls that have been used to represent twin and twins, and they've, it's, it's been um, a lot of these Ibeji dolls have been um, uh, stored and collected in various museums all over the world. But in the late 60s, Prince Adewale Yanuga, the student, was collecting photos of twins and dedicated a a real part of the archives towards um, twins and twinning. And that's another thing that we found to be really interesting in the archive. The third thing that we found in the archive that was completely fascinating was the fact that the archive was synchronous with the period of the Nigeria Civil War between 1967 and 1970. And then the, the, the prints would make indentations of photographs, like if he hears about a person who had died in the war, uh, at the war front or someone who got injured and was in the hospital, he'd make a little note about it or he would make a cross if the person had passed on a right RIP and, and, um, and really kept an active journal around and correspondence with people back home around what was going on in the country at the time. So we were able to build the Oyenuga family tree and the prince and his relations and his descendants and we've been and then we tried to find the twin for two years actively looked for the twin for the for the prince or his family and then only recently did we find the prince the prince's wife and and his daughter and his son and we had a handover ceremony very recently in lagos um so in lagos photo 2021 we 
produced postcards based on images from the archive. And then back of this, each postcard, we had a summary of the project and we said this in, we, we just wrote a short summary in 1967, Prince Adewale Nuga was studying at the prestigious Escuela Masana in Barcelona. And while he was studying out there, he left an archive with Anna Briongas' mom and the prince had disappeared ever since and we're desperately looking to find him. Anyone who has information should please write to info at africanartist.org or send a, 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 a text to the, such a number. And so this postcard became a way of creating an investigative tool for the prince to find and locate the family. And we kept this going and we had an exhibition recently in Malaga in Spain where we launched the Searching for Prince at the Walo Yanuga project. And, um, and eventually only two or three months ago, did we locate the prince's first son and locate his wife. And they're both, they're both in Nigeria. And we're able to conduct a ceremony at the Spanish consulate last week while um, as part of Lagos Photo 2022. And we handed over the suitcase to the family. So this whole journey came full circle with the return, the moral imperative that Anna Briangos' mom had and Anna herself had to return the suitcase. She traveled all the way to Lagos spent time with us. She'd been to Lagos on two other, one other occasion to meet with the foundation, to meet with Lagos Photo, to travel around and to do a kind of investigative um, journey with us, looking for the prince, going through the archive and trying to locate the family in Lagos. We never found the prince because we found out only recently that he passed on uh, about 15 years ago. But his descendants are still alive. His wife is still alive. The archive is still very valuable and very meaningful. And um, I'm very interested in, and we've also commissioned a bunch of artists to produce work in reaction to the archive. And I'm very interested in how we can think about new ways of creating this, a safe space to archive these, these sort of um, artifacts of our history, artifacts of our heritage, artifacts of um, that are beyond the Benin bronzes, the shiny objects that everyone talks about and celebrates and everyone is sort of obsessed with. But restitution for me um, goes beyond the conversation that happens between diplomats. It goes to, on a microcosm, it's really more important for me and to find the way to connect people through these stories, through these common histories. And photography has an incredible role in shaping memory, in shaping identity, and in creating these opportunities for us to understand where we're coming from better, our identity, our futures, our hopes and aspirations through these common collective um, narratives that we share and are embodied in objects. And these objects that we pass from generation to generation are the very, um, are the very artifacts of future histories. So these are some of the images from the Home Museum. And we created, I like to see, tell me a story, um, guide me by name. So if you want to explore the museum, the online museum that we built through images, um, it was, you can build your collection, an association of objects that are, that you have in common, or perhaps tell me a story, um, um, categorizing images through a timeline that is relatable through the narratives that are uh, that are that are synchronous or you go to the first slide the first uh, the first uh, window it's i like to see just a general guide and you browse through and there we go rapid response restitution Lagos photo 20 um the home museum this was a letter that we sent out to the general public saying dear friend we hope you and your family are keeping well during this trying time remember this during the lockdown I write you. Uh, I, I write to you to invite you to participate in an exciting initiative that is being organized by Lagos Photo Twenty. You don't need to have a professional camera. You may just use whatever device you have. A smartphone is fine. The, the, the idea is to shine your eyes on our homes as if they were museums. We invite you to take part in building this new virtual home museum. Um, and there we have it in fun in various languages. And then this is a list of some of the, the participants in the home museum, some of the objects that were sent in. And it was interesting and intriguing to see that a lot of people sent photos of photos, you know, 
as um, as these as uh, representative objects of virtue. Yeah. We had also people sending books like uh, Arrow of God, you know, Achebe's famous work of um, a first edition, Kekain. And, I, and there we talk about uh, unpacking the suitcase. You can see to the right of the image, the RIP, the letter from Anna Briangas. I eventually went to Spain in August of 2021 to actually get my hands into the archive and to see and explore the archive that was a sword in the, in the suitcase as well. A traditional sword handed over through generations to the prince. So my recent assistant going through the archives. I'm scanning some of the findings and the, the, this is the prince practicing his signature. The Oyunaga family tree, the intelligence we're able to find through the through the archive, the history of the family. A bit, we built a bit of a family family tree, and we went looking for each member of the family, but it took us two years before we could find anyone. And then we find here the history of studio photography. There you go. I have talked about Paramount Studios, Fakun Studio. All of this was the intelligence we were able to honor through the archive. If I may, the, the interesting thing about studio photography in in that, that we we've been able to explore and we've been able to honor through the archive not just the archive but we know that studio photography played a very important role a very dialogical role for africans at the time because you have to remember um there was there has always been a way to connect with the through images through to, to the imaginary and um in previous times, it was the Babalawa, it was a spiritual guide that you'd consult and you'd have this dialogical experience where you have a conversation about your future, what you want to do with your, um, what your aspirations are. You meet with the spiritual guide and they'll consult the oracle and they'll come up with an idea around your future and then they'll create um, a, a kind of one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. And then from there, they build an image for you to follow, a path for you to follow. Um, in, the, in, the, in the late 19th century, or in the early 19th century, rather, 20th century rather, these studio photography um, uh, spaces became replaced those Babalawa um, um, spiritual consultation and became the space for, to have this sort of spiritual and visual guide with the with people with citizens with africans around futures around your imaginary so a guy would go in and say look i'm into, i'd like to be a, a teacher and the photographer would say mm, i don't think i don't think you, you you want to be a teacher maybe you should consider becoming a nurse or a doctor or something like that you have an appetite for this and then they would um set up a background and hand you a lab coat and put a stethoscope on your neck and make a photograph for you and hand you the photo um, the very next day. And then you take it and that vision shapes your memory and shapes your vision and your identity and your, your aspirations. And this, this was a very big thing at the time. All of the icons of photography that we know today, Mama Kasset, Malik Sidibe, and the rest of them were just like, you know, they were available on each street or every second street in the late 60s or in the early 60s and the late 50s in Africa. And, um, and I've always been intrigued by how the role of images, the role images play in shaping visions of identity and in charging memory. Um, so this is a quick summary of the idea that I hope everyone was able to get it despite the interruption. Maybe a conversation with Shuda will allow us be more, um, shed more light on some of the presentation that I've just had. Thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Thank you, Azu, for that uh, presentation, which was so rich with ideas and also for braving on despite the attempts at disruption. I think it's quite a feat of courage to not lose your nerve and, and for all of us to have the patience to sit through the presentation despite these interruptions. And I think your the final uh, reveal of the slides was was actually very instructive. I was thinking about the fact that when you were speaking, 
we were imagining the visuals in our mind because th there was a way in which the photography or the images were actually taking place within our consciousness. And it was interesting, for instance, when you talked about the, the suitcase of uh, Prince Adewale, I was trying to reimagine this suit or imagine this suitcase. And then when the images actually transpired, it was fascinating. Which I'll make a few, I'll make a few remarks before we move on. I'm quite intrigued by your beginning with Marcel Duchamp because, um, and this has something to do with this dislocation between image and language. So we heard you speak, we didn't see the images, and then we saw the images in our mind, and then we saw the images in real life. Um, I believe that Duchamp, when he was asked about his formative influences, talked about a performance he attended by Picabia and uh, Apollinaire of uh, Raymond Roussel's Impressions of Africa. Yes. in which he said he couldn't understand what was going on. It was just the image that captivated him, and he divorced it entirely from the spoken text and language. And in that way, he says he discovered the language of images. Um, so like in many things, uh, we know Cubism owes a debt to African sculpture. We know, um, uh, we know many other art movements in Europe owe their debts to points of origin outside Africa, and so perhaps it is Dada and Surrealism. So it's very fascinating for me to, to see this as a part of a circular journey where your invocation of Duchamp is actually revealing a secret of Duchamp's invocation of the profound influence of an African aesthetic sensibility on his own, on his own language, which made me think a little bit about the little that I saw of the exhibition of Lagos, the photo festival this year. And um, I recall certain images that were shown of the student protests in Lagos yes. that you had this year. And it was very fascinating because there was an immediate resonance with student protests in Delhi, often about the same issues, about uh, the raising of fees, about privatization of education, or about uh, attacks on the autonomy of educational institutions. And there's a remarkable correspondence between the images that I saw in front of me in the exhibition and the images that were stored in my mental archive of my own city. And that's, again, if we talk about the future of the museum, one of the things that I think images do is to produce these moments of um, correspondence or of resonance and echo between very different experiences. So when we look at a studio portrait, we are reminded of the idea of the many studio portraits we have seen. We are reminded of the performance of portraiture. Um, I know that, for instance, um, you have been in conversation with many young photographers and artists in Lagos. I had the opportunity to visit the studio of a young woman photographer, Mobolaji Ogun Rosoy. And uh, again, her work is about portraiture and about destabilizing the portrait through a kind of sculptural incision that, that explodes the face and other parts of the body and that presents itself in, a, in an almost, um, in, as if there were elements of photo sculpture. And I know that she, when she told me that her conversations with you have been very productive in making her think about herself as an archive of her own imagery. So it's very fascinating to hear what you said about the immediacy of restitution where photography becomes a means by which we recompose the world. I'll end by referring to another photograph from the Reuters collection that you had on the wall, which is by a Delhi photographer, Danish Siddiqui. And it's an image of a Rohingya refugee woman getting off a boat and landing, and she has her hands on um, the soil. It's a remarkable image because it talks to us about displacement, dislocation everywhere, and the photograph although it hides the face of the woman, is able to connect us to all these experiences of eviction, of dislocation, of migration, of forced movement. This way, the photograph produces a certain kind of restitution in our consciousness. We're able yes. to restore the world to ourselves through an encounter with the making of photographs and the viewing of photographs. So thank you for your presentation. Um, if you would like to respond, and then maybe we can open the room to further questions. I appreciate that for those uh, poignant observations. Um, they are um, really much at the very acute end of the idea that we're trying to espouse. Um, um, 
the Umar Singh Shergill Constructed Image Grant has been something that uh, we've pushed for the last, the idea of constructed image, the constructed image rather, has been something that I've felt to be very important in resisting the traditional methodology or the traditional modes of presenting narratives, especially as it relates to um, colonized or oppressed nations. And so the radicality in allowing artists like Anita and Imran to construct through imaginary their own reality, their own vision of the world. And you know, the reason I went through the various um, iterations and titles of, of uh, edition of Lagos Photo was to sort of show how we evolved our ideas from the concern with the way others perceive us as um, colon previously colonized people or people uh, nations in transition or in desperation or in need or in an existential crisis to the, the spot where we are designing our own futures and realities and to the current point where we're actually beginning to archive our own we're, we're interested in our own common humanity and we're trying to build a more you know egalitarian a more inclusive future where we do not feel like we we are victims and um um all of those freedoms that come from constructing images whether it's in your studio to promoting an idea of like the images that you've seen you've seen at the exhibition Lagos photo uh where we for the first time we almost exclusively showed reportage photos we've never really done that in Lagos photo for various reasons but I we we decided this year that we're going to stick with our sharp pointy end where it's really about um the news end of images I feel like if the evolution is so necessary to the point where we are this particular phase where we're no longer in the we're no longer creating a pushback towards where you know you got a bunch of people flying in from New York or wherever to come and tell our own stories. We're telling our own stories and we're telling stories of our own reality. But what we need is solidarity. And you know, the image of the Rohingya touching down in the soil, that is something that maybe 10 years ago the photographer would be obsessed or would be. It wouldn't work if the image, the face, and the portrait of the of the of the migrant wasn't captured. But today, there's an awareness, there's a sophistication of the visual language, whereby just the mere gesture is enough to tell to tell the story. And this is the evolution of visual language and visual culture that has happened in a in a in a Anthropocene age that allow us to really engage with images and narratives through this methodology without constructing that particular uh, dehumanizing um, representation or illustration of the problem, but still encourages us to have empathy with the stories, with the narratives. Um, and so again, we're talking about the secularity of economy or the secularity of narratives. These these modes of visual storytelling that was said to be this is the way to this is the reality we're going to tell the you know, we're going to present the problems of Africa or wherever of Asia or China or wherever it is and to bring it to the rest of the world by you know by Western journalism has come full circle because in that whole evolution over the last say 15 years major players from previously um colonized nation have developed and evolved a language that allows us to represent ourselves in a more real, in a more nuanced manner. So yeah, that's that's a very true, true, true representation of these ideas. Thank you for that very thoughtful response, Azu. I'm wondering if people have questions or observations or comments, uh, this is the time to start putting them down. You could put them down in the chat box and um, I can pass them on to Azu. I'm very fascinated by your posing of a tension or a dynamic between what you call diplomacy and restitution, the, the restitution of the spectacular Benin bronzes and so forth, which takes a long process and is almost a public spectacle. And also this immediacy of restitution with 
people cons constructing their own archives and images. Do you think these are two different temporal registers? Do they sit uneasingly uh, along with each other or do they speak to each other in some ways? Well, what I've always said is, you know, there's a, there's a violence where the, the, someone has come and robbed you of your own heritage, your own history, and then there's a celebration of that return. You know, it's a another level of abuse where they also pat themselves on the back because they are returning things that they should have, they were taken morally, immorally away from your progenitors, from your, from your people, from, you know, a way of interrupting your history. And then the whole return becomes something that is super political where the agents of the return are, you know, a diplomat who will get a promotion or get to travel around and be fettered and, you know, there's something quite immoral about the whole process in my mind that I find to be quite uh, problematic. But I'm more interested in the restitution of memory, of history, of heritage, of knowledge, and those things that are that we've lost, almost like I describe it a bit like a phantom limb, limb, something that you know is not right, that isn't there, and how do you connect with it? And I found a photography has a a beautiful way of abbreviating memory and filling the gaps. You talked about how during my presentation, I didn't have the images. And so you're able to force yourself into a sort of intelligence to think. What happens when you listen on the radio? The radio really is a way of sparking a visual intelligence much more than a television. Because when you watch, a, when you watch TV and you watch a documentary, for example, it's very illustrated. But when you're forced to listen, and the interlocutor, the narrator describing visual objects or visual uh, scenarios, your intelligence, another aspect of your brain is peaked and awoken. And that's something that I've always related to with photography and restitution, a way of sparking another part of your intelligence and sparking you to be creative and free. So to answer your question, I'm interested in what artists and thinkers and can do to abridge this gap. We all know regardless an archive is always contaminated, an archive is selective. And so the freedom that artists have to interpret an archive, not to make it personal or not, to make it real or not, is something that I appreciate and I think to be quite valuable. Yeah, you're muted, Shuda. Yeah, I, I was saying that I completely agree with you that the reality or prospect of physical restitution doesn't actually resolve the question of what decolonization means, especially when it's large colonial collections and museums. We have a question that's actually, I think, related to it. And Latika asks, she says, I'd like to ask Azu his views when an archive should not be made visible. Archives that contain violence, archives that ask to be restituted by the descendants of enslaved people, and she says, I'm thinking especially about the archives at the Harvard University. What would you say to that? Um, I've always thought that um, censorship is the biggest thing in, in, um, in a moral context. Having said that, there are certain things that are certain forms of violence that have been captured on film and, and um, archives that need a certain delicacy in the way they are shown. I mean, there are in, um, I once visited an archive in Germany with, um, where a lot of, and through uh, a lot of sort of research was conducted on people and it was super violent and super scientific in a very pseudo scientific way that is, um, objectionable and completely immoral. But if someone was to say to me to destroy the archive, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be against it because I think that, um, you know, if you were to tell our descendants that this actually happened in a 50 or 100 years time, they probably wouldn't believe it. They'd say, oh, you're just talking complete rubbish. And then until you bring the evidence of it, that this is what people did in Europe, 
in the 19th century, in the 18th century, in Congo, in Belgium, you know. So it's about the sensibility and the delicacy in how it's shown that's important. But I do not think that um, um, there's a one-term easy solution to, to show these sort of specific problematic archives. Thank you. Um, any other questions that anyone has or observations? There's a question from um, Ramesh Babu, and there's another question from Malavika. Ramesh Babu asks, <laughs> would like to know Mr. Azu's opinion on the submissions for the grant and the path of Indian contemporary photographer, photography as a curator and member of the jury for the SAAF, uh, this, the Shergil Sundaram Foundation grant. So that's one question. If you want to reply to that, I'll ask the second one. Yeah. So if I repeat, he wants to know your opinion on the submissions that you saw as a member of the jury and the path of Indian contemporary photography that you can discern from that. Um, thank you. It's a great question. Um, I, I believe I speak for the rest of the jurors as well when I say that we were massively impressed by the submissions. We thought there was a lot of creativity, a lot of um, innovation in the visual language adopted by the photographers. And I'm very close to a lot of Indian curators and I do a lot of portfolio reviews and I've seen the work of a lot of Indian photographers and I've been to India a few times over the last four or five years myself. I'm part of a, a fast forward photography conference where I, we had a workshop in Delhi. And um, I think the path of the India and the Bangladeshi and uh, and um, and also the um, the Sri Lankan phot photographers has been really um, accelerated over the last 15, 20 years. There have been so many great photographers coming from the, this these parts of the, this part of the world for, and it's been massively encouraging to see. And I know several several photographers from, from the from the Indian subcontinent who are good friends and who are making incredible work. And not just to constructed images or missing scene, but also um, rigorous documentary photography. Um, if I was to suggest anything it would be that i'd encourage more indian photographers to apply to as many grants and um and um photo prizes as possible because we just don't see enough people apply and when you when they do apply they you know you always have a good chance and photography is an art but it's also a craft by that i mean that being seen is enough you know, the fact that you have a jury of, say, five to ten people, experts in various fields, even if you do not emerge as a winner, you know, the fact that these other people have seen your work in this way, they will definitely contact you, you know, for various projects based on the, on the quality of what you've done. So I really encourage a lot of Indian photographers to keep applying for and to keep making themselves as, as visible as possible. There's so much potential out there. Thank you for those very encouraging words. And I was thinking about the fact that uh, Imran and Anita had applied earlier and didn't get selected, and then they applied again. And I think as someone who's been on several juries, what I really appreciate is persistence. I mean, I think there's a great faith that you have when you apply again, and sometimes that does get rewarded. Um, two more questions that we've got, one from um, Malavika. And she says, related to Latika's earlier question, I'm also thinking of Tina Camp's practice of listening to images, using images made as tools of surveillance and subjugation, and finding affective potentialities within them that signal a rupture in colonial logic. So she's probably asking us to read the colonial archive completely counterintuitively, and maybe I'd love your response on that. That's, that's a great point. Um, and I feel like if you know, the visual language that allows us to deconstruct these colonial archives comes with an awareness of the power of, of the image in itself. You know, if you, um, I curated an exhibition recently that, that debuted in, in Derby in the UK called The Cultural Evolution. And I took the cue from Chairman Mao's 1966 Cultural Revolution. 
and the role of images in constructing these ideas around subjugation, around decolonization. And, um, and I was also intrigued by the um, Mao's very strong awareness of visual language in constructing identity and in decolonizing the nation. And for everything you can say that is terrible or problematic about China today, they're the one nation that has completely decolonized itself. And that came with a radical distrust of the West and their programs and their interventions in, in society over the years, especially you know, over the period where the China, where China, over the century where the Chinese could describe as a, the century of shame, you know, that period created a healthy distrust of Western ideas in China that allowed them to shape, maybe, you know, we can, of course, we could, you know, criticize and say very extreme, radical um, um, programs as a, counter narrative to those ideas uh, to those to those problems at the, at the time but we find that um they are the only nation that has completely effectively shipped a new narrative for themselves so i'm not an advocate of china or their methods or anything like that i'm saying that a healthy distrust of the way we read the colonial archive and the way we center the western ideals really allows us to rupture those narratives and shape new ones and to read and listen to images in a different way Yes, and I know Tina Camp's work really well, and I'm, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, great points to be taken from her work. There's also um, Sadia Hartman's work, um, where she reads the archive from a completely different, not a victim perspective, from a completely radical shift in the logic of the subjugated. Um, Wayward Life Beautiful Experiment by um, Sadia Hartman is a great reference point for, for those interested in this sort of rereading the, the archive, the colonial archive, or the subjugated or the oppressed archive. There's one other question uh, from Joanna Mehdi to uh, you. She says that something that the image of the stock, the constructed image is making me wonder how much of photography is about the artist and his quest towards constructing, in inverted quotes, the decisive image, then it is about what the photograph is supposed to represent. Isn't then the medium by nature restrictive and we should be more empathetic to the cause of the photographer too, asking them to simply produce great imagery, something I find a serious lack of now. So I think she's pushing us to think about the limits of the nature of photography itself. Yes, the idea of the the decisive moment is still a choice, right? You know, who decides and what is the decisive moment? It's, um, um, it's a bit of a myth in visual storytelling. And of course it limits and it, it prejudices what is the true representation of a, of a situation, of a scenario, of a narrative for that matter. Um, but I think, yes, the visual language is limited, but the film is also limited. There's always inherent biases in any form of um, representation or narration. And, um, and, but we have a diversity of tools to represent stories, to represent um, um, ideas. So we are, not as, we are not restricted to one. Um, we even have NFTs now to complicate matters. So the visual narrative and the decisive moment is something that is, um, I would say, not as significant as it, as it was a hundred years ago as it is today. Um, we have, we can create, the photography also works with a sequence of images. So now you have the, the uh, smart cameras and you can make four or five images in sequence and tell a story rather than have the, the, the difficulty of the paint of the, slow camera where you have to find that decisive image so it's really changed the the digital technology has really changed and expanded the idea of the 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 decisive moment and moved the narrative a little bit further thank you uh malavika also says thank you um i can't help thinking about an image in my mind over the last few minutes which is a painting by the chinese artist zi xin ning of um 
which looks like a photograph of Chairman Mao looking at Duchamp's urinal, except that this never happened. Um, so here is something that blurs between painting and photography. Um, it's Mao looking at its product in an industrial art fair and this paint, this artist has repositioned the incident to create an allegory about photography, conceptual art and the, and the reading of images. So I was thinking about that when you were um, talking. Um, but I think, uh, I think your presentation has been very fertile in making us all imagine new realities in our heads, like this one, for instance. And so thank you for that. Thank you for being on the jury and for being paying so much attention to thinking about um, the future directions of contemporary photography in India. And uh, please come again and let's meet under circumstances other than that of a spy novel. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand over to Latika to conclude this session. Thank you so much, Azu. Thank you, Shiga. Thank you all. Um, thanks, Shraddha. My name is Latika Gupta, and I work at the Shergil Sundaram Arts Foundation as Director of Projects. On behalf of SSAF, I'd like to first apologize to you, Azu, for the distressing interruptions, and I don't know how we can thank you enough for, you know, carrying on regardless and for this excellent lecture. So th just thanks are really not enough at this point. And thanks also to Shraddha for chairing the lecture uh, with so much grace uh, through the interruptions <laughs> and also leading the discussion. I'd like to thank the jury for the Amrao Singh Shergil grant for photography for the constructed image. Azu Nuagbogu, who was the jury chair, Ranbir Kaleka and Pushpamala. We'd like to thank the nominators, but also the applicants for their time and fantastic proposals. Congratulations again, Anita and Imran. We're all looking forward to following your work over the next year. Um, at this point, also a very special thanks to Devika Dolat Singh, who's part of the advisory panel of the foundation, but who has also been instrumental in the inception of the Umrao Singh Shekhar grant, which is the flagship program of the foundation. Um, the grantee announcement for the Umrao Singh Shergil grant for the category of documentary photography by the jury chair Shahidul Alam, Ketiki Sheikh, and Tan Tanvi Mishra will be on the 2nd of December. The announcement will be followed by a lecture by Dr. Shahidul Alam, and this will be chaired by Naeem Muhaiman. And before we close this evening, I'd like to introduce the SSAF team. Saurav Sil, who's in charge of visual design, media, and archives. Malavika Madkulkar, Assistant Editor Publications and Communications, and Santosh Sani, our Accounts Executive. And again, for all of you who've joined from around the world, thank you not just for your presence, but also your patience this evening. And I hope that you will join all of us on the 2nd December. Thank you so much.